Hello and welcome to The Heat. I'm Mike Walter, broadcasting via Zoom from my home. This is the new reality as we deal with the pandemic and COVID-19. The United States is now facing nearly 2 million coronavirus cases with more than 112,000 deaths. The U.S. economy is also struggling to recover, with some 38 million people filing for unemployment benefits since the pandemic began. Joining us now to discuss the economic impact of COVID-19 is Paul Romer. He's an economist and policy entrepreneur and a co-recipient of the 2018 Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. Paul, thanks for joining us so much here on The Heat. Paul, as you know, uh, the coronavirus now, the case is uh, nearing 2 million. Uh, we've got over 111,000 people who've lost their lives as a result of the pandemic. What's it going to take to get America back to work, do you think? You know, the thing that would be best is if the United States could learn from and copy what China did in Wuhan. Their use of aggressive testing at scale, population scale testing, was how they wiped out the final uh, stage of this infection in Wuhan. Um, that same approach is what we should be doing in the United States uh, th throughout the country. And unfortunately, we're not. So uh, the prospect at the moment is that the current sis, uh, situation is likely to continue. About 100,000 people getting infected each day, 750 to 1,000 to people dying each day. I think that best forecast is that's going to continue for months. Let me ask you, and I want to go a little bit deeper on what you just said, but I, I'm thinking about recent days. I mean, all of these people out protesting uh, in Georgia, people waiting for five, six hours to vote next to each other. Talk to us about kind of the exponential effect of all of that. I mean, what people keep talking about a second wave in the fall, it seems to me a second wave could come in three weeks. Yeah. Um, the, the, I think the, the background for this is that it's not really appropriate to talk about a wave because that makes it sound as if we've come off of the peak. You know, we've reached a trough from which we might uh, rise again. We really haven't ever gone down into the trough. We've just leveled off at this relatively high rate of uh, deaths and, and infections. So that's the background that I think is not getting enough attention. If you want to have a slightly more nuanced view, um, it's true that there was a big spike in New York City, and then there's been a big decline in deaths and infections in New York City. But that's really quite different from the behavior in the rest of the country, where in the rest of the country, we just leveled off at a, at a, at a plateau. Now, could these, uh, could these demonstrations, could some of this opening up lead to a, an increase? That's, that's possible. But um, I, I think even if we don't see that, the problem is, is that the infection is continuing at a rate that's high enough that it could act as a, a, a source of fear and hesitation that keeps us from fully recovering for, you know, I think many months, perhaps as long as it takes to get to the point where we have a vaccine, which might finally get us down so we're not getting 100,000 people infected every day. So you say test, test, test. And, and I think if you were to suggest that to uh, the current administration, they'd say, oh, it's just too costly. It's cost prohibitive. Uh, give me your case for it. And, and how much would it cost? Yeah. The way to think about this is the rate of return. If you spend a certain amount of money on a test, what would it give you back in terms of just increased economic output? My estimate is, is that the rate of return on a dollar spent on testing is about 50 or 100 to 1. Each dollar you spend on testing would get you 50 to 100 dollars back in increased economic activity. So when you get that kind of return, it's just foolish not to spend on, on uh, the tests. Now, that's assuming a cost of a test of about $10 per test. Right now, it's 10 times that, $100 a test. But I think if we made it a priority, we put some research effort into it, we scaled up, I think we could easily get to $10 per test. Even at $100 per test, the rate of return is still about 10x. Uh, you get about $1,000 in economic value for $100 that you spend on testing. So even at that high price, we should be doing much more of it. And I guess what you're talking about is, is pouring out $100 billion towards this. Uh, and, and really, you mentioned Wuhan as a model. They were able to test all these people within a, a 10-day range. And you're talking about 14 days, right? I mean, is that yeah. what, what yeah. we're looking at? Yeah, it's the same. You know, if we did roughly what they did in, in Wuhan, 
we could be certain to drive this this uh, uh, this this virus uh, basically down very close to zero within a relatively short period of time. So uh, th this is the model we should copy. The, the administration in Wuhan has shown that it's possible. We should just do it. Let's talk about another administration, the Trump administration, because it's almost like Dickens' uh, Tale of Two Cities. Uh, you, they, there's almost two responses, one which is towards uh, the country itself, the other within the White House, uh, where testing is done on a regular basis every day, and yet we don't see that in, in the wider uh, context of the United States. Give me your sense about uh, these kind of dual messages we're getting from the administration. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a nuance here, which is that unfortunately the test system that they're using in the White House is one which is not as accurate as the PCR tests, which are what they used in, in Wuhan. So there's been a little bit of noise about the fact that the White House is using a, a test that has some false negatives. It fails to pick up some people who actually are, are infected. Um, but I, I think some people have pointed out, and this is the right observation, that if we can do this for people in the White House, we could do this for anybody. And, and we could certainly start out by offering this kind of protection for, for example, the, the police officers, the hospital workers, the transit workers, the people who are already back at work doing essential jobs. At a bare minimum, if we were testing them, they could make sure that they weren't getting infected uh, by their colleagues. So that if one of their colleagues was uh, infectious, you'd catch it and you'd, you'd keep them from coming on the line. That won't necessarily protect them from the public, but that would be a very good place to start is testing these, these essential workers, where we know there's a lot of transmission um, between uh, colleagues. You talked about uh, return on investment. Uh, there's also a, a famous uh, phrase, which is consumer confidence. Um, consumers really can't be confident going out there, can they? And isn't that one of the problems with getting an economy going again? I mean, when you look at China, it seems to me people know that they're going to have masks on. They know that there's a lot of testing going on. There's contact tracing. It yep. seems like people are going back out into the economy, whereas here in the United States, I still see people shying away from it. Yep. There are some regions of the United States where the number of infections is very low, the number of deaths is very low. And so people there are kind of reacting, why should I be so nervous? Why can't I go back to, to normal? Unfortunately, there are many other places where the infection is quite, you know, is, is quite prevalent. A few people, even in those places, are going back to normal activities, and that's going to lead to uh, a higher rate of uh, infection and spread. Uh, but a lot of people are still staying home. And so the way I describe this is like, when am I going to be confident going back to see the dentist, have the dentist check my teeth? What it's going to take is I'm going to want to be able to see that the dentist had a recent test, shows me that the dentist isn't infectious, but the dentist is probably going to want to see that I had a test before the dentist has me come in and sit down in the chair. And by the way, you know, I can't get my teeth checked with the mask on. So, you know, we're going to have to use testing for some of those things. And I, I can't eat a meal with a mask on. So the masks can be helpful. They're very good at, at limiting the spread, but there are some uh, settings where we need something beyond just the masks. The U.S. president's uh, pointing to the, the latest jobs report, uh, 2.5 million people back on the, on the rolls, uh, back at work. Um, do you feel like we've kind of turned the corner that, that it's going to increase or, or because of these concerns that you're talking about, that where does the economy go? We're still at a very high level of unemployment, the highest level of unemployment we've seen in my lifetime, the highest since the Great Depression. So um, there's nothing good about the circumstance we're in. And the fact that we had a bit of a recovery off of a very low level, I think is no assurance that we're already on the path where we're gonna see continued recovery in the months ahead. It's interesting because China, as you mentioned, is, is, is ahead of the United States, uh, reopening. Uh, but, but one of the things that they're seeing is a large decline in export orders. And, and this is, yeah gets to globalization. I mean, if, if, if things are going okay in China, but they're not back up in, in the U.S. or other parts of the world, uh, and, and this interconnected quality of our um, economies, um, talk to us about kind of the lingering effects and, and the stop-start kind of approach to things. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I think every national government will need to be able to do is to help provide another source of demand, another way to use all the productive capacity in a country when demand falls in the rest of the world. 
One national government cannot control what happens in the rest of the world. Governments can try and cooperate, but they're not very good at that. So every country that has a significant share of its output devoted to exports is exposed to a risk that it can't control, that the demand for exports will fall. And the way to protect against that is to have a government which is ready to say, okay, export demand is down. There's some other things we can do domestically, like build high-speed rail, invest in more housing. So that's one of the key roles for the government is to play this stabilizing uh, function. The president of the World Bank has described the pandemic as, quote, a devastating blow to the uh, world economy. He's warning about the economic fallout. I mean, he's, he's saying something in the neighborhood of 60 million people could be pushed into extreme poverty. I mean, those are really bleak uh, numbers. Uh, what's your sense on that? Well, you know, one of the surprises so far is, is that the pandemic has not made as much of an inroads into some of the poorest countries as it has in the rich countries. I think this shows you something about our modern, um, affluent, highly connected lifestyle. We fly around, we go to, to lots of meetings, we go out to, to restaurants. Um, so, so far at least, the, the, the impact has not been as large in the developing world. The developing world will suffer from the same problem of a reduction in, in export uh, demand. But we also, it may be a little bit early um, in the sense that it may be that this virus will start spreading in the developing world. It just hasn't gotten there um, quite, as, quite as rapidly. So we still have to be uh, concerned about the risk of you know, serious losses of income um, and deterioration in the quality of life in, in the developing world. The, the one saving grace here is that if, if we can just delay the onset of this problem, there's a chance that we'll get a, vi a vaccine soon enough so that they don't get hit with the full force of uh, the virus. Let me ask you about recovery. Uh, you know, a lot of people talking about V-shaped recovery or this or that kind of recovery. Uh, if you were to come up with an initial or design, what, the re what would the recovery look like? I think right now we're, we're looking at best at the kind of recovery we saw after the financial crisis, which is, um, uh, it looks a little bit like a check mark, a very sharp decline, and then a very slow, gradual return to, uh, to normal. Paul, thanks so much for your insights. Uh, stay with us. You're watching The Heat. This is a show for people who love exploring, discovering, and experiencing life stories. A diverse, rich, and beautiful land will introduce you to extraordinary people like this woman in Bolivia taking back their heritage and independence, a fantastic 14-year-old who created a bank to help kids keeping them off the streets, entrepreneurs who are making a real difference every day, America's Now, only on CGTN. Welcome back to The Heat. The brother of George Floyd made an impassioned plea to members of the U.S. House Judiciary Committee. Polonius Floyd asked that his brother be honored with the end of police violence against African Americans. Floyd's death has ignited worldwide protests calling for police reform. Joining us now from Washington, D.C. is Steve Shigaris. He's an independent journalist and political commentator. Steve, the uh, brother of George Floyd testified before the House Judiciary Committee today, and, and it was really compelling. Uh, one of the lines that really struck out for me, he said he doesn't want his brother to just be another picture on a T-shirt. Um, can this actually be a turning point? Where, where do you see this going? Well, you're seeing House Democrats, first of all, putting forward uh, uh, their ideas for police reform. They want to pass a bill, and then they want the Senate to, uh, to pass their bill, which w would uh, be pretty aggressive in terms of Police reform. We're not talking about defunding the police, as some uh, activists are act, uh, asking for, but uh, other measures to reform the police. But uh, there are differences in between uh, what Republicans want, what Democrats want, and it's like any other issue that hits Capitol Hill. Uh, if there's no middle ground to be found here, then it could just go away and not get done. And 
it's, it feels like, though, after watching the protests the last uh, week or so uh, and seeing what's happening, that there will be some sort of movement uh, moving forward in terms of police reform. What that is at the end of the day, we don't know. Of course, the president hasn't weighed in on what he thinks about all of this, other than he's letting Senate Republicans take the lead in pushing uh, their ideas out there. So we'll see where we are in a few weeks. Uh, watching this, this Congress, uh, a lot of people don't have high hopes, uh, but the moment uh, might be one where uh, something actually comes together. It's interesting you brought up Senate Republicans. They sort of have optics issues in a way, though, don't they? I mean, the uh, Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, casts about. He finds one black senator, Tim Scott. He's going to be in charge of coming up with the reforms. I mean, that kind of speaks to, to one of the issues that party itself has. So what kind of reforms could you expect from the Republicans? Well, uh, I think near, not nearly as many as the Democrats want. I think you'll see some of the obvious ones, like mandating that police wear uh, uh, cameras, body cameras, eliminating chokeholds. But you know, the, the, the key for the Republicans is they're in pretty tight with police unions. Police unions around the country support Republicans more than Democrats. And so they don't want to uh, totally offend police, uh, police officers and the, and the unions. And so whatever they come up with has to placate police. Uh, but also has to, again, as I mentioned, speak to the moment that we're seeing right now. If you look at polling that has come out in the last couple of weeks, uh, there is a movement toward uh, the idea that police are, are too hard on African Americans, uh, that things need to be changed. And so I think Republicans see that it is an election year. Uh, and so that always plays into these kinds of things. So uh, I would not be shocked if the Republicans come around to something uh, in, involving reform. But the question is, is how far do they go? toward what the Democrats want. That's the big question. That's always a big sticking point. You already brought up defunding the police, which has become a kind of a rallying cry for some of the protesters, which, you know, when you look at it on, on face value, it's like, oh, we're going to dismantle the police. But what they're actually talking about in some sense really does make sense. You know, reallocating some of these funds, perhaps not as much towards the police, maybe more boys and girls clubs, more towards mental health issues, which a lot of these cities, frankly, do have a problem there. But it's become a politicized issue. You see uh, Vice President Joe Biden saying he's not in favor of it. So talk to me about threading the needle uh, for Biden in terms of his constituency and this issue. Well, so there's a couple of things. First of all, uh, if you're threading the needle and you're explaining what your message is, then you're already fall you've already fallen behind. And so the idea of defund the police, when the average person hears that, they think of what you would Think, uh, think of when you hear defund the police, like what, you're gonna get rid of the police department? It goes back to other issues that Democrats have faced in the last year or so, like uh, 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 Medicare for all, which was a, a message that was put out there that's, that scared a lot of voters, or abolishing ICE, remember on, on, on the border uh, between US and Mexico, getting rid of ICE. When it didn't, those messages actually, if you drill down on what they meant, didn't actually mean uh, the stark idea that comes out of those messages. And so Democrats, if they support this idea uh, of defunding the police will have to really explain to people, and that's not a position they want to be in. What Joe Biden did was immediately after Donald Trump seized on the idea that Democrats are going to be behind this defund the police idea, Biden came out, said very quickly, I don't support defunding the police, but here's, here are the reforms that I support in terms of dealing with police moving forward. I think you're seeing Democratic leaders across the board really uh, taking that strategy uh, mainly because, again, it's an election year, and you've got to appeal to the most, the largest group of people. Polling shows, uh, at least early on, polling shows that people don't really support the idea of literally defunding the police, but they do support measures to reform police. You are hearing in Los Angeles where they're going to kind of cut funding to police, redirect some of those funds. Uh, Minneapolis uh, City Council uh, talking about these issues. Do you think that this is going to be an issue that's going to resonate on on the local levels with some of these cities? Well, it could. And, you know, at the end of the day, in crime-ridden areas, do they want? Do people that live there want more police presence? Do they want uh, more protection? And if they do, and they see that they're getting less of that because of these reforms that are being pushed in terms of uh, moving uh, funding around, then perhaps it could be an issue. But I think we have to see what the outcome of it is first before people react. Uh, I think at the end of the day, though, where it becomes an issue is when you have uh, some candidates, usually Republicans, who are out there saying. Uh, we want law and order, we want to keep the peace, uh, and Democrats don't, and they're soft on crime. Uh, these are issues that, that have been hashed out over the decades in U.S. politics, and, and to the benefit of the Republican Party. The question now, though, is has sentiment changed enough that people are willing 
uh, to entertain the idea of maybe reforming the police involving uh, less funding to police and more to other things. We'll see what happens as that moves forward. But it seems like the, the times have changed a little bit that people might be more receptive to that. It'll be very interesting politically to see how it plays out. President Trump has already met with a lot of law enforcement officials. Uh, he doesn't seem to have very much interest in talking about systemic uh, racism in the United States, which is obviously a problem. Does he need to do more to do outreach with African Americans? Is that likely? Uh, I don't know how likely it is. I think what we've seen from this president, at least the last few months, in terms of the twin crises of coronavirus uh, and uh, what we've seen with the, with the protests and, and, and the police issues, is that the president, uh, at least Americans, have felt that he has missed these moments in terms of speaking out uh, about these issues and either consoling people who are affected by them or looking at ways forward uh, as to how to uh, make these issues better. Uh, he's, his critics have said he's basically gone into bunker mode and, and is really just living on Twitter and blaming others and insulting people, while his supporters are saying, uh, look, you know what, he's trying to, uh, to, trying to fix uh, the economy that's been affected by these issues, or he's trying to fix some of these issues uh, that are a result uh, of these debates. At the end of the day, the American people are really not necessarily buying what the president is selling, and I think he has to confront that. He has to figure out a way to speak to the American people. His approval ratings are down. Uh, his uh, approval ratings on each of these issues is low, and so he has to speak to, uh, to the American people and say what he's going to do about police reform, about racism, uh, speaking to African Americans. We'll see if he does it. He hasn't done it so far. Um, and we'll see if he feels that he, he needs to do it moving forward. Steve, the election's five months away. Uh, and as we all know about politics, five months is an eternity. It's a lifetime. But how much of a role is race going to play in this election, do you think? It's a good question. And we don't know. I mean, you look at five months ago and the issues that we were talking about five months ago. Uh, and, and how we're not talking about them anymore, whether it's, uh, I mean, impeachment was a big deal five months ago. That's not even on the radar anymore. Uh, we don't know the answer to that question. Anything can come up between now and November. If the economy gets better, are we going to be talking about racism uh, as much uh, moving forward? Look at historically just dealing with this issue. We've had police shootings of African Americans. We've had police killings of African Americans. And, and those issues have gone away after a few months. Is that going to be the case with George Floyd, or is this going to be something that lingers? We don't know. Uh, and that, I think, is the hope of Republicans and President Trump, that something will come in in the next few months and change the dynamic uh, of what he's been dealing with politically. I mean, he has been dealing with issues that he's been un unable to, to win the, the uh, support of American people in his handling of this stuff. And so they're hoping that something comes forward, whether it's a rebound in the economy or some other issue coming out of the blue that changes the dynamic in this race. It could very well happen, but it also could be that we are still talking about George Floyd in November, and uh, you know, we, we'll see what happens. And Vice President uh, Joe Biden, uh, the former vice president, has not picked his running mate yet. Uh, he has said it's going to be a woman. Do you feel like there's more pressure on him now to also select an African-American woman? Yeah, there's no question that this, uh, this issue has, 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 has driven Democrats to tell the former vice president, look, you, you, this is a moment where you need to meet the moment in terms of who your running mate is going to be. And so there's a short list of African-American women uh, who he's been looking at, including uh, Senator Kamala Harris of, of uh, California, uh, Congresswoman Val Demings of Florida, uh, and, and uh, the mayor of Atlanta, Keisha Lance Bottoms, is also on that list. And we'll see where he goes with this. But it seems as if this is leading to a moment where uh, Democrats are really going to put some real pressure on him to pick an African-American woman, somebody who can help him uh, speak to these issues, uh, and perhaps that's one of the things that will keep this issue in the limelight between now and November. Voting. Uh, this week we saw it in Georgia, long, long lines, a kind of uh, a dysfunctional operation. The Washington, D.C. also had its issues not too long ago. Uh, got a pandemic going on. You want social distancing, all these people out there. Uh, we saw what happened in Wisconsin. A number of people did come down with the virus. Talk to me about your concerns for November. Does this kind of pose an illustration of what we're going to be faced then? Well, if states and, and localities don't figure out how to administer elections in a way that is going to prevent this kind of chaos that we've seen uh, in Georgia, in Washington, D.C., and, and frankly, a lot of the states that have been having 
primaries the last few weeks, you've been seeing uh, examples of this. If they don't figure this out by November, this could be a major, major problem. And it's not just at the presidential level, but you've got Senate races that are going to decide the, the majority in the Senate. You've got House races uh, that could decide uh, 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 s significant uh, flips between Republican and Democratic seats. Uh, and, and then uh, local races as well that might be affected by this. These, the administration of, of an election, trying to change how elections are done, and that's what's really going on here because of coronavirus. You have states and localities trying to change really quickly, going from the majority of people walking into a ballot box and, and placing their vote to trying to do it remotely uh, via mail. Uh, that is not, it's easier said than done. And a lot of people want to give uh, voters uh, the choice of being safe and being able to vote from, uh, from their home so they don't get exposed to coronavirus. But it puts the onus then on the folks counting the votes to be able to do so. And what we're seeing in the last few weeks in these, in these states and localities is they don't have the apparatus to actually count, the, first of all, to actually send out the number of ballots that are being requested, but then being able to, uh, to accurately count those ballots when they get back. And that just leads to a lot of questions on the back end uh, by candidates who may lose in, in, in races that are very, very close. And if that's the case, I think we're in not only for a long count on election night November, in November, but perhaps a lot of people protesting what the results are. Steve, briefly, if you can, uh, President Trump talking about having these rallies again in a couple of weeks. We know that he doesn't like to wear a mask. We believe that a lot of his supporters don't like wearing masks. Are we going to see, what, what are we going to see as a result of this? And politically, uh, what do you make of it? Yeah, I mean, the president knows that he gets energy and enthusiasm and his base is, in, is enthusiastic about his rallies when he has large numbers of people in an arena uh, for him to throw red meat to them uh, in his speeches. Uh, and he wants to get back to that. He thinks that not, being, not doing that is what's hurting him in terms of the polls. And so, yeah, that's great from a political standpoint for him. Uh, but again, what are the health repercussions of that? Uh, one big question, and you're seeing conservatives already start to talk about this, is, well, the protests last week were basically, uh, they're, they're saying, uh, an opportunity for this virus to spread. So uh, if it doesn't spread because of the protest, well, why shouldn't we be able to get people together for rallies moving forward? And if that, you know, we'll have to see what happens with the protests. If there isn't a huge spike, then perhaps Republicans can point to that and say, look, there's evidence that things are calming down. We can get people together and do this. But if there is a spike, people are going to wonder, is this the right thing for the president to be doing, getting all these people together inside in these arenas, uh, some without masks, uh, while coronavirus is still going? That's it for this special edition of The Heat. I'm Mike Walter. Thanks so much for watching.